Many families immigrated to America in hopes for a better life, but due to overpopulation, they were crammed into tenements and were overworked and underpaid. Jacob Reese's exposure of the tragic living conditions of urban tenement housing during the Gilded Age led to housing reform legislation, a triumph for the modern American city. The 1840s was a time of immigration for many people. During the second wave of immigration, immigrants came from all over Europe and some parts of Asia. They arrived at Ellis Island in New York City. While arriving to the States, the Statue of Liberty was sure to welcome all immigrants. A poem on the Statue of Liberty states, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This poem, later added in 1903, states how the Statue of Liberty welcomed all those who the world will not. Ellis Island, located in the upper New York Bay, was the gateway for over 12 million immigrants arriving to the U.S. and was the United States' busiest immigrant inspection station for over 60 years. Many immigrants migrated to America because of its economic opportunity, political freedom, and more work opportunities. Some of their home countries had food shortages, overpopulation, war, and political instability. Not all Americans welcomed new immigrants. Factory owners loved the cheap labor, but many religious leaders were concerned about the increase of non-Protestant believers. Concerns about immigration during the Gilded Age led to the rise in nativism in America. Advocates of nativism held the belief of favoring native residents as opposed to immigrants. As a result of immigrants admiring America's freedoms and work opportunities, a massive amount of immigrants came to the U.S. during the Gilded Age looking for work. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company factory in New York City is an example of one of the most tragic moments of America's industrial history. On March 25th, there were 600 workers at the factory when a fire broke out in a rag bin on the 8th floor. There had been multiple safety procedures put in place but were not kept up to date and at the time of the fire were of no use. The factory burned down and killed 146 workers. As a result, a series of laws and regulations were created that better protected the safety of these factory workers. The overpopulation of immigrants coming to America from Europe led to harsh and inhumane living conditions. Most immigrants lived in run-down and overcrowded apartment buildings called tenements because they were an affordable place to live and only one most immigrants could afford. In the 1850s, population grew rapidly from 590,000 to 1,068,000 in the 1860s. Since tenements still were fairly new and there were almost no laws regulating them, builders would try to build as many as they could as fast as they could. People were crowded in. There were windowless tenements. Sometimes you had no internal plumbing, just privies in the basement, in the backyard. And the Lower East Side during these years was the single most crowded place in the entire world. Many tenements did not have indoor bathrooms. And if they did, five to six families shared one toilet. Most shared outhouses in the yard that were not connected to a sewage system and would fill the streets. They didn't have none of them. No, they didn't have none of that. There was a lot of things missing those days. Mm -hmm. A lot. I can't, you can't compare what they went through and what we are today. You can't compare. It's altogether different, another world. Streets. Oh, I've seen in New York yeah, when I went to work, yes. They said bags, they used to put paper bags. And that was their trash. Nearly 40,000 people a year died in New York City from disease, poor living conditions, and contamination from the tenements. So life was very, very, very strict, very poor, and not able to have what you have, your accommodations like today. I sick, and some of them were really sick, you know. Mika Brees, an American newspaper reporter, social reformer, and photographer who with his book How the Other Half Lives shocked his readers with pictures of the slum conditions in New York City. Reese immigrated to the United States from Denmark at the age of 21 and held various jobs in the city. In 1873, he became a police reporter assigned to New York City's Lower East Side where he found that in some tenements, the infant death rate was 1 in 10. 
By the late 1880s, Reese had begun photographing the interiors and exteriors of New York slums with a flash lamp. Those photos are early examples of flashbulb photography. When revealing these photos to the wealthy, Reese would sometimes pose or stage his photographs to make the conditions look even worse than they already were. He wanted his photos to shock the audience by creating a strong and moving visual, like men living in dumps or children playing in filthy streets. Reese used the images to dramatize his lectures and books. He did this so that the wealthy people would donate money to help reform the issues of tenement living conditions. These pictures were compiled into a book titled How the Other Half Lives. These photographs helped make the book popular, but it was Reese's revelations and writing style that would hook the readers. He wrote in the book's introduction, is dark enough drawn from the plain public records to send a chill to any heart. Theodore Roosevelt, future U.S. president, responded personally to Reese. I have read your book and I have come to help, he said. The book's success made Reese famous and How the Other Half Lives triggered the government to act and make a change to living conditions and tenement housing. It also became an important precursor to the muckraking journalism that took shape in the United States during the 1900s. Jacob Reese was one of the best known muckrakers. Muckrakers were crusading journalists who helped bring about several governmental reforms. Reese would eventually write over 15 books about what he saw in the tenements. He even made fictional stories about families living in them. In the 1900s, various tenement housing acts were passed in hopes to solve the housing problems. Along with these acts came a set of rules for new buildings to follow that would fix the issue of poor ventilation, waste in the streets, and fire safety. These rules included the need for a window as well as a source of light, natural or artificial, for every room. Landlords had to install metal fire escapes equipped with ladders and fireproofing. The law also required one indoor toilet for every two families. In 1895, New York City Mayor William Lafayette Strong appointed Colonel George Waring, commissioner of the city's Department of Street Cleaning, to clean up the filth in the streets. Colonel George Waring was an agricultural chemist, but was known for leading increase in health sanitation through the Gilded Age. Waring put into place the first organized system for cleaning the city's streets once filled with human waste and garbage, with the goal to remove all trash from public areas. This reformation drastically improved living conditions as well as prevented disease from spreading quickly. Colonel Waring's efforts would change the image of the sanitation department and introduce fundamentals that would lead to modern systems of recycling, street cleaning, and waste collection. By the late 1920s, many tenements in New York had been demolished and replaced with large, privately subsidized apartment projects. Throughout the next decade, the implementation of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal policy would be put into place. The New Deal was a serious project instituted during the Great Depression, which would transform low-income housing in many American cities through programs including slum clearing and the building of public housing. The Housing Act of 1937 creates the United States Housing Authority, which helped ratify slum clearance projects and construction of low-rent housing. The United States Department of Housing Urban Development was founded in 1965 and was designed to help Americans with their housing needs. Public housing was established to provide safe rental housing for low-income families, the elderly, and people with disabilities. There are approximately 1.2 million families living in public housing units. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development administers federal aid to local housing agencies that manage the housing for low-income residents at rents they can afford. The Fair Housing Act prohibits landlords from discriminating against tenants based on race, gender, religion, national origin, family status, or color. Those that were once treated poorly with low wages and despicable living conditions were eventually given a chance to live a life full of greater value through the help of Jacob Rees, his photographs, and the modification of the law. Today, thanks to things like the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Fair Housing Act, housing and labor in America has improved drastically. Yes, it all about it. He does get you some more strength, and you learn a lot from others, you know, how others did and how they carried on, you know, and then you take it from there, and you learn their, their ways practically, you know. To do it. That's it.